So, introduce yourself and uh, go on. Thank you, Per. Uh, yeah, so I'm happy to present you the Plaster Hashing Competition, the project that will hopefully ruin the business of Jeremy. So that you won't be able to grab passports because you will have better consumers. And as you've seen in the previous talk, many services to use MD5, SHA1, sometimes with a source, sometimes without. We even see things like this. People read from that they should use hash functions, not the use functions, but they still store password in clear. So the goal of the password machine competition is that everybody, all services, use strong password machine, use strong password protection methods. So I'm originally a researcher, an academic researcher, and I'm working for a private company, and I've been part of the recent Shas3 compilation organized by NIST, and prior to that, to the East Stream compilation, which was about block sectors. Um, when the ES competition was thrown out, I was not in the game yet, but I can talk to you about this one. So the, the, the idea for cryptography competition is that the organizers, they choose a type of crypto primitive, the block sectors, the ciphers, hash functions, public encryption, and they publish a call for submission. So say, we would like to receive this kind of design with these properties, and we you guys according to this criteria, security, performance, so the people are happy, there's some things, and they're evaluated by a panel by researchers. And if you look at the incentive incentive exchange, they call people of the meters to track the others. So people study research, they publish papers about security analysis, performance analysis, and so on. The organizers shortly set the missions. In the case of Shas3, it was approximately 14 out of 54 received. And after 14, they shortly set it to five finalists. And they, they eventually picked one. Um, so it was AES, 97 to 2000, box at first, 15 submissions, five finalists, and right there, the Belgian Belgian side for the competition. And it was history. You may not have heard about it because it did not. Um, Give a formal manner just recommendations. Maybe you, you know the site of Sasa 20 by Dan Bernstein, so it's one of the winners of this stream. And it's just three more recent, it was won by Ketsak, so it was designed by the same guys as AES and Swindle. And it was 51 submissions. So, as I said, it's basically demolition derbies. I uh, should create a version of your analogy. Um, yeah, you in this game, you try to beat the other designers, their submissions, and at the end, they can enjoy the big, the one that survives. It's not the survival of the, or the most secure or the fastest, but really the one that is the most adapted to the environment. The needs of the users, the, the requirements as perceived by the organizers. If you look at just three, Yes, that was a really good function, but the others were also really good. Maybe some other were a bit faster, a bit simpler, a bit more secure. But according to this, yes, I provided the best balance with respect to their criteria. And if you look at the side of contributors, um, so academics, they really like it because they're going like to uh, publish the best papers, publish a lot of papers of good quality. So this is a good opportunity to make great research and to publish it. Uh, when I made the, the count uh, for this competition, there were more than 50 academic formal research papers published due to the just competition. So they get better reputation if they publish great research, more papers obviously, they get money from the governments, and it's not often to attack your colleagues' designs. Okay. <clears throat> so it's basically free work for the organizers and free work was millions of dollars. So that's great one is most of the contributors were Europeans and the reason that the work was to Americans, Euro, so that's great one is. Um, so we have a yes, a stream, just three, and we have PHC and CDA, which is about authenticated ciphers. That's not the topic of the talk today. Okay. So as per mentioned, PHC is starting now, but we published a call for submission in January. Uh, I mentioned that I created this, but I only 
mentioned the idea on Twitter, because see all these you know, people having great ideas, uh, uh, great expertise, and after Shastri, uh, when I came with my academic background of cryptography, I said, well, that's the, that's the best opportunity to attend the competition. We really need something better. We have the knowledge, we have the expertise, and we have the need from the, from the market, let's say. So that's the perfect time to start this. And people who were very enthusiastic, uh, very happy and proud to have yeah, people like, like Jeremy, like Swag Designer, like a few people around in this room. So I really tried to have the, not the best people, but the people who would be the most helpful for this competition. It's not sponsored by any organization or any company. We don't receive any money from anyone, so we have mm, no bias, we are neutral, try to be neutral and objective. And the panel that I was mentioning, we have a list of approximately 20 people um, from industry, academia, and even the US government that matter from NIST, from the crypto group of NIST, um, to have crackers, people who know how to attack passport, which means they know how to evaluate the security. They will be able to know whether this one is um, Easy to implement GPUs, where it has to attack a different ratio. We have software engineers, we have cryptographers. So the goal was really to have the best mix of people um, to either the submissions. We don't want to miss anything, because if you look at previous competition, sometimes, in my opinion, they were a bit too focused on, on cryptography, which means that we have submissions that were very good from an academic point of view, from a theoretical point of view, but that that missed some points from being uh, using practice. So what are the motivations? So I don't think I need to repeat myself. You, you know everything that happened in the past four hours. So. so one of the typical argument is, okay, just to decrypt our script. Uh, you've heard about decrypt and script before, so I'd like to provide a bit more details and to explain why script is not, um, not perfect. As a matter of fact, script is not used a lot. It's really DarkSnap, which is the um, system of coding Percival, who did that script. Uh, I believe it's used in a few other systems, but it's not as popular as Shawan. It's even much less popular than, than Decrypt. Decrypt is used, for example, by Twitter, by Living Social, um, by a few other systems. But nobody uses Decrypt, nobody uses Script. Um, I've, had to, I've had to ask the question why. Uh, maybe briefly, summarize how script is working. The idea of script is to force the defenders and for the attackers to make a lot of operations and to use a lot of memory. Um, like someone said before, using a lot of memory is not just about allocating a huge pool of bytes, but also making many accesses and unpredictable accesses to this memory. The first step in script is to initialize a larger array to fit with random values. This value that should depend on the password, otherwise you can pre-compute it and it's be completely useless. Now that we store this in memory, and the second stage is to make unpredictable accesses to this, these elements. So you get a relatively inadvertent switch and material access, and this pattern aims to be pseudo random, and this pseudo randomness is seeded by the password and the sort. Okay. So why script is uh, not used a lot, so in my point of view, one of the reasons that it's really not simple to, to understand and to implement. I don't know if you've read the research paper by Colin on, on script, so it's really a, a good walk with some really interesting attempts to make more formal, more scientific, there's a lot of insights, but it's quite sophisticated, it's not really accessible to, to developers. And if you want to implement script really from scratch, so you have to look at two main components, SMIX and MFGrip. SMIX is a procedure that uses another procedure called RAMMIX, which itself embeds BlockMix, which eventually calls SALSA28, which is the core algorithm of the SALSA20 stream cipher, which I mentioned before. And then you also have to implement MFGrip, which is this DBGDF2, which is HMAC, which is this shot crisis. 
you have to implement one, two, three, four cryptographic primitives as well as these uh, procedures. So it's a lot of code, a lot of bugs, a lot of tests, a lot of time. Um, not sure that all organizations can afford this. So maybe they will pick an existing model. You have a model for script in, uh, or in C, in Python, and languages. So now you have to integrate it in your application. You have to choose parameters. There's really three, three parameters, N, R, and P. N is the integer walk metric. R is the block size parameter. P is the partition parameter. But R also affects the parameter of the function. So from that point, you might guess that P does affect the ability to make part implementation of, uh, of script. It's not clear whether it's the, as the uh, local level using SIM the units or, or for using multiple, but it's not an important point. Is that much more what are the objectives of N and R? So what material mean? You can get, if you increase N, you have more work to do, more time, and or more memory. R seems to be a, a block size, probably the size of the blocks that you read from memory. Um, so if you don't think too much about it, you will look at the parameters specified by encoding this paper of this size. There's a few recommendations. For example, we've got two or three or eight more sets of parameters. But maybe you have very specific applications, maybe you run it on a mobile phone, maybe you have unlimited memory, unlimited time. We really like to have the best parameters for your application. So I want to understand how is affecting the performance of script. So actually, N and R they have essentially the same effect on time and on memory. You can make N times R basic operations. So the which means the time works linearly with n, linearly with r, the same factor. And memory is also nr, 128 bytes. So it has exactly the same influence, theoretically, on time memory consumption. And I made the experiment uh, on a CPU, as on a sniper bridge. And the color is the actual time spent to hash a password. On the y axis, you have the logarithm of r, and then there are the logarithm of n, of n. And you see that the have exactly the same pattern if you go vertically or horizontally. Um, I'll get you more for this, but I don't think you need to say it. Um, I will show it in my back end talk, but just, just to show that, that this works. That means that it's no difference if you double the value of n or if you double the value of r. So you are a developer, and from your point of view, n and r are exactly the same thing. You don't know what's happening behind the uh, Journey. You don't understand how N and R will affect differently the attacker with the GPU or with the ASIC. You just care about your, your application. Another problem that is yes, mentioned here that maybe you have yeah, limited memory, so you want to be extremely slow. You don't have any latency issues, you don't have any latency constraints, but you have memory constraints. And with script, it's not possible to make it slower without increasing the memory consumption. And the other way around. That's my point of view one of the one of the issues with script. The other issues being the style of the code, the number of components you have to, to use, the fact that you have to reuse PBKDF2 to understand how all those guys work, and also that you have to choose parameters. So what I would expect from the PhD competition is designers to come up with more more simple things with maybe two parameters, one for time and one for memory. And if you increase the parameter of time, memory remains constant in the other way around. It's less easy to do than it, what it sounds, but that would probably be the easiest to understand for developers. Because we don't want to pay developers for not being experts. We are the experts, the developers are developers. Okay. So I believe we do something better, and that's why we have this call for submissions. We have very simple requirements. You want your we want your function to hash passwords, so to take strings of, uh, of bytes. 
we don't make any assumption on the encoding. It might be SP, it might be Unicode, it might be your own proprietary character encoding scheme. We don't really care about this. Machine data, machine bits, machine bytes. Uh, we make the assumption that, yeah, 128 is already a reasonable size. You may support more than that, but this is what we want your function to support, at least. We also one function to generate a 16 byte, uh, to, sorry, to use a 16 byte sort. So you might also support shorter or longer sorts. That's what we need to be a reasonable length, so we want a function to support sorts of 128 bits, and at least one cost parameter. It might be cost, it might be time, or memory, or mix of cost. But in our, in the API we specify, we should at least have one cost parameter. We don't make the assumption on how it behaves, if, if, the, if the speech should go linearly or exponentially. That's up to your design. H dot is a hash of 16 bytes, or more or less, but at least 16 bytes. This could be limited with respect to a few criteria. The first obvious one is security. How how we define security for a password hashing function? So we don't have to define security for a block cipher. You should not be able to decrypt. The key should be secret. We also pretty much understand how to understand how to define security of general purpose hash functions, no collisions, no prime images, indifferentiality from a random oracle, all these great notions. But for password hashing functions. What, what do we expect? Of course, it should be, it should be one way. Given the hash, you should not be able to go back to the password that was used. And you shouldn't be able to go back to any other password or string that map to this hash. And it should also be pseudo-random. The pseudo-random is um, generally defined in terms of the key hash function when you have a secret. And when the secret is known, you make Oracle queries with this function. And you should not be able to distinguish the output from true right in perfect randomness. Um, we don't need really to constitute very formal notions, but there should be no properties that make the hash non-random, whatever non-random means. Um, like I said before, it should minimize the ratio, it should minimize the advantage of the attacker. So this is your job to define uh, how to define this ratio, which is a difficult problem. And the cost parameter should be effective. It means that if you claim that you, the hash function has to use one meg of memory, there should be no way to bypass this requirement. And it should be flexible, scalable, and some is resident to such a uh, Simplicity, something that is often overlooked by professional cryptographers, they make very sophisticated, it's a very sophisticated design, very clear algorithms, sometimes with things like fast rate transforms, uh, um, commutative algebra. But what you just want, what you just need is something simple, at least easy to, to get right. So not just about the specifications, but also about the implementations. You don't regarding the specification, you don't want the you don't want to assume that the reader knows about um, Atlas Mathematics or has 10 pages in math. And about implementations, it should be easy to translate, get the spec to code. And like Russell said before, it could be great if this reports instructions from the CPUs and you don't have to, to emulate an operation with several instructions. Uh, design choices, I don't have much time on this one. And I'll go to maybe the most interesting part. Um, so the, the two items, let's say. Uh, first one for cryptographers. Um, I'm not very happy about the state of research. Um, maybe it's because the problem is too applied or it's not maybe formal or mathematical enough, but it's there's been very few research by academics on this. Fewer than 10 serious research papers. So I would like to, to see people getting interested in um, formal constructions of password hashing schemes in defining notions, defining formally what is a password hashing scheme, what is the security of a password hashing scheme, 
and how to prove secure constructions that use an arbitrary hash function, for example, like SHA-1, SHA-2, or SHA-3, and that uses this hash function to construct a secure password hashing scheme. That's what PBTDF2 and script try to do to some extent, but we can do much better than that. And the academics, they will also look at dedicated hardware architectures, and obviously a script analysis. One of the challenges maybe more for software engineers or password crackers is to predict the future, which is now to be a difficult task. Um, the problem is we don't know what will be the hardware that appears in 10 years, even in two years very difficult to predict how will the next generation of graphic cards look like. But we don't want just to protect users today, but in five, 10, or maybe 20 years. And we want to minimize the, the advantage of attackers yeah, not just today. Uh, so for example, you might want to explore the latest feature in Intel's microarchitecture as well. We have this nice uh, uh, two five five six bit registers. There's some crazy functions. There's uh, SIMD memory lookups, EPRMD, which is very good for crypto primitives. So you might take advantage of those to minimize the advantage. But maybe the recently announced APX512, you can also find with instructions to use the password chain hashing scheme. And in the future generation of Intel, there will be another new set of instructions. So you should settle something and choose what what is the best balance. Um, now let's use leakage resilience. So yeah, it's a bit size and resistance. Let's say you use a huge table. Um, maybe you've heard about cache timing attacks. And that information on the secret can, can leak from the access pattern from the time user. Because depending on the cache line you access, you have a different latency value. So the idea is that if the pattern of memory lookups is dependent on the password in a in an impractical way, you will get information on the password if you are able to monitor the uh, memory lookups. So do you expect a user to write their memory after they have the password? Do you expect the hardware to be to the temper proof? You have to make the assumptions you make on the attacker in your submission. And obviously, if you support password of arbitrary lengths, you will have time issues because with a password of one million characters, it will not take the same time with the same characters. Case uh, of hashing is a very, very challenging problem. In the service, if you forward this, this server to make more competition, to use more memory, then you might expose it to the risk uh, of the OS. Maybe, maybe not depend on the application, depend on the server, depend on, on the infrastructure. But I don't think that should be, that should be in your And finally, availability. Let's say you have a set of hashes of 1 million users and you update the new hardware instead of having one server. You have a much more complicated system, much more powerful servers, much bigger cache, much faster CPU, and you want to make stronger hashes. You, you want to take the same time to hash a password, and given your improved hardware, you can afford using more iterations, more memory. So how do you directly go from the hashes to stronger hashes? You might ask your user for a password reset, or wait until all the users read out your service. It would be great if you could offer this kind of functionality directly upgrade hashes to stronger hashes. There are other ideas, um, some crazy ID like programmable hashes. Here the idea is that the cost parameter does not define just the number of iterations, but it really defines the hash function. And if you think about it, it's like a code generator for a virtual machine. You take a password you sold, and from this you generate a program that is interpreted by a VM. So here the problem is interoperability, performance consistency. Um, I'm not sure it's a good idea, probably not, but maybe you can think about it. Another crazy idea is uh, security for obesity. Um, yeah, the idea is to have to take your hash database of maybe one megabyte and add millions and millions of 
demi values that even if not like a Pfizer database, you won't be able to figure out which one are the digit hashes and which are the fake ones. Okay. Again, this sounds like a crazy approach. Maybe it will work on some system. Probably it will not work for all systems, but again, we can probably think about it. Okay, so I'd like to. Very handy to organize in December. It won't be the same temperature as uh, outside this room, maybe the same as in this room. Yeah. I think the idea is to make it a um, bit more, not more academic, but uh, yeah. But get more people interested from the academic care. Yeah. Okay. Now we are outside of the room, so we actually have to pretty much leave the room uh, now, so there won't be any answer questions at this point in time. But I have to ask you, would you like to come to our party at uh, our place tonight? Sure. Hey, yes. So there will be an opportunity to talk to Shafalik there. And now, 